Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we have commanded you. And the Lord direct your hearts unto the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Amen. Well, with that reading of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1, was our primary text. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. Let's look to the Lord in prayer and asking him now to uh, have free course in our hearts as we engage our minds into this part of the worship service called the sermon. Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to be the supervisor. He will allow him to be the teacher, the preacher. Allow your spirit, Father, to use the very word of God as that two-edged sword that is quite capable and does uh, d divide the heart of, uh, asunder the, from the joint and the marrow. Let the word of God be what it is, as, as uh, quick and living and alive. We ask, Lord, that our hearts now would just tune to you to receive the scriptures, to receive the lessons, the intent of the writer, and what you have for us today. We pray, Father, that it would be the scriptures would uh, be effectual in our hearts, bringing us to a, a closer likeness to the character and the conduct and the mind of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ be a blessing to this time for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this past week during staff devotions, we focused our attention on, on prayer, primarily that of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus uh, rearranges our priorities. He rearranges our priorities in that he places our physical needs secondary to the kingdom of God. And so when he gave to us the Lord's Prayer, he set forth the Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he moves to give us this day our daily bread. So he, he places there for us the order of priority in our prayer time. Now, we, we actually throughout life have inverted that. We've taken the priority and made it our, our material needs, our health needs, our financial needs. And so if, we, if God were to be so generous to always answer all of those prayers, we would have a, a God as a utility. He would be the God that is of the great provider. He would make sure that all of us had exactly what we wanted. And in one sense, we would prefer that. But what happens then, uh, the very interest of God, the, co the reason why Christ came to this earth to help us to preach the gospel, to establish the kingdom, and to proclaim Jesus Christ would now become secondary to our material needs. And one would think, well, if we have everything that we need, now we can focus our attention on God's work. It would not work that way. There have been times in all of our lives when God has given to us what we've asked for, and our yearning for him has not changed one whit. We just have another need that comes along. So when we look at this passage of scripture here this morning, it, it reminds us of the very uh, pinnacle of a worship service and is that of our prayer, of, of, the, of our preaching. In that from whatever happens in the back room here in my office, the preparation of the sermon to the delivery of the sermon, to the receiving of the sermon, Paul reminds us that prayer is essential for all of these things so that this word of God will be able to move swiftly and find its place by way of regeneration or sanctification in the hearts of the listeners. So as we look at this, we'll divide the text just basically into five different parts. I, don't, I hesitate to go to five because that immediately implies that we're going to go well over an hour. 
Well, not necessarily true because a lot of this is, uh, we already know it, but yet I want to make the emphasis. And so as we look at what uh, God has given to us, the writing of Paul, and we put this into context of during preaching, the, it's important, it's imperative that we have prayer. We've just observed these five things. That prayer is necessary for every sermon. And during a sermon, the, the prayer that we would have as members, in other words, we are, we are engaging ourselves, our minds are uh, anticipating that God is going to speak through the word. And so the prayer request would be that it would be a biblical sermon that the text is going to be only the text, and that it, and the, the message flows from the text of the scripture. We would pray that God's word would move swiftly, and that's what he means when he uses that expression, that the word of the Lord may have free course. So you have, as Paul writes, prayer for us, as he's about to go on his journey, we bring that now back here local, we pray that the word of the Lord, the scriptures, the gospel message be biblical. We pray that the word would find its place and move swiftly. We pray that Jesus is the one that is honored and glorified as he gives to us and, and have free course and be glorified. In other words, God wants to see converts. God wants to see people growing in grace. And then we would pray that we evidence Christ in our own lives. So when we put those all together, we have to understand that no sermon can stand just strictly upon human resources for its effectiveness. It's not going to stand uh, on persuasion or education or logic or reasoning, comedy, or whatever else we think is needed. And oftentimes, uh, men will depend upon it, and sometimes people will depend upon uh, the, a class act preacher to be able to make sure that the word leaves an imprint and, and we have the attention of the audience. Paul didn't ask for any of that. Paul had much of that, but he didn't depend upon it. Preaching and listening can only be by the very power of God. It is a Holy Spirit, God-driven, God-oriented, biblically-based act of the mind as we come together and we engage that uh, faculty of thinking and reasoning and listening into the sermon. So every sermon must be scriptural. Every sermon must uh, be without interference, that it may have free course. Every sermon must exalt Christ, and every believer must evidence the progress of God's word in their very lives, the evidence of conversion. Your part in this, as we come together, is to realize that it, while you are here, and you know, I did my part, and even now as I preach, I'm still doing my part, that, that God, we pray and we ask God, make it something that is powerful from the scripture, that it can be as strong as a, a runner, that Christ is exalted in my heart, in my life, and then when you leave here, you have plans to evidence Jesus Christ in your life. So during the preaching time, which of, of a worship service, prayer is necessary to bring about this biblically unhindered Christ exalted message of the word of the Lord. And that's why we are here. And while we are here, we wanna make sure that we have a proper preparation during the course of the message. It really, the great benefit is because our, our prone to wonder, Lord, I know it. And we have a lot of things are heavier upon our mind. I'm not even going to mention one because you might be distracted by the mere mention. But we know that we bring baggage and luggage and, and other interest with us into the auditorium. If we focus on the idea that here it, that, that we've done the singing, now the preacher is going to present the word of the Lord, and we've, we've been to focus our, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, that allow the, the kingdom work, the kingdom message of the Lord, may it have precedence, let it have a priority in my life, let it press deep into my heart. That would be our prayer. Now we are engaging our body, our soul, and our spirit, and our mind into the, the most important part of the one hour or so that we are here. So the first point that we look at is that of uh, prayer is necessary for every sermon. 
because it is precedes preaching. When uh, I would r highly recommend, you know, the, the psalmist says this, come into his gates with thanksgiving, with praise upon our lips. We might also say, come into his gates with prayer and prayer upon our lips. We have no idea, you do not know, sometimes I do not know what the sermon on Sunday morning is going to be. It is a cause for prayer. We're asking God to give me a message for you and for myself that God would do the work through the pulpit, through the preacher. So the preparation can only be effective if it was preceded by, as Paul said, pray for us. As he's gonna go on his journey, he realizes he cannot do this on his own strength. This preacher cannot prepare a sermon on his own. It's just not gonna work. I can talk to you about Fox News. I can give you the headlines. I can tell you about the uh, political breakfast we attended yesterday and all the, the progress that is making in Tallahassee, and, but that's not a sermon. That's rhetoric, that's news, and there's enough of that to go around. We all uh, must recognize the fact that not everybody on every Sunday uh, are believers. Paul writes, and he says that we be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, from not all men have faith. Paul realized that as he would go about and he would preach, not everybody out there was going to be a Christian, and there would be those that would oppose to it. But at the same time, we pray for their salvation. And we want to pray that God goes to work in our hearts. He gives us some of that in the verses that follow. For example, beginning at verse three, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both will do and will do the things which we command. Verse five, and the Lord direct your heart into the love of God in the patient waiting for Christ. That is another way of saying we're watching God do a work within our hearts and we invite him to do that. We surrender our hearts. Sometimes we have to pray for a surrendered heart. We have to pray for an open heart. And so the, the, the very onset as Brother Charlie reads the text and then I come forward to, to explain the text and then to apply the text, your responsibility, my responsibility is that this is not something that stands by itself. We must pray for the effectual working of the passage of scripture to be applied to our hearts. As this continues on, the next thing we'd recognize that we would ask, dearly ask the Lord that the uh, sermon hold biblical content and that it would be accurate. We are dealing with the word of the Lord. In the Old Testament, that was the expression for divine authority. The prophets, thus saith the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord says this, and he would speak to Isaiah and to Jeremiah and some of the others, and they would always use that expression that it would give the idea that it is not the prophet that is speaking, but is the word of the Lord that has a message for the people. So when Paul writes and says this, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord, the message of the scriptures, the message from God to humanity, to the lost, to the Christian, it is the, the authoritative word because it is God's language. It is God's heart. It is what he desires. It is not ever to be decided and interpreted as well, that's what the preacher says. That seems to be what Pastor Bill wants, and no preacher ever can take the liberty of persuasion for personal interest. It must always be a biblical sermon, and allowing the word to speak for itself, to be uh, expository and explaining what God has already written without adding to it or twisting it or modifying it to fit our times. The word is that which makes the message effective. It is not the rhetoric, it is not the style. There's a lot that is lacking in, in my preaching style. You may find others that, uh, that are uh, tower above the ability to preach. But you gotta remember what really matters, what God wants to capture our heart is the very scriptures. And so in Paul's day, he would want it to begin with the gospel message. 
the word of the Lord pertaining to the way of eternal life, the word of the Lord as he provides the good news that Jesus Christ died to save sinners, the good news that you need not be one that suffers an eternal damnation, but you can have faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That is the good news. And Paul would say, pray that this word would find free course that it would go unhindered, that it would be powerful and effective, but it would be the authority of God himself. And continuing on in that same idea that the, the preaching of the word of the Lord must be the whole counsel of God. And with that then, this entire counsel of God, everything that the Bible has to say, when it is preached, has to be in its entirety, not holding back on certain things. And so we find that when the gospel was preached, when Paul would deliver the full counsel of God, it had an effect because it was the word of the Lord. I draw your attention to that of Acts chapter 13, verses 48 and 49. I will read it, you write it down, but it is this way. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many has been appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. When they heard that God was interested in them as a people separate from Israel, and the message that was given to Israel, they rejected, and now when they turned, Paul says, I turned it over to the Gentiles. When they heard that, that they had been invited to receive eternal life, to receive God's grace. And it says, when they heard this, they glorified the word of the Lord. They did not glorify Paul. They did not glorify the, the outline of his sermon. They heard the authority of God, that they are invited. They have been brought in and participants of the kingdom message. And so they glorified that word of God. And as many has been appointed to eternal life believed, they responded to the invitation to come, ye sinners that are weak and weary. So we see that the sermon, when it is biblical, and when it follows the, 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 uh, the, the biblical language and the outline and the message, the original, original intent of the writer, it brings about that sense that, God's word is wonderful. That should be what you look for at the end of any message that you hear. That when you leave here, you want to be able to say something to this effect, that God's word spoke to my heart. Try to do as John would, John would hide behind Jesus Christ. John the Baptist wanted Jesus Christ to increase while he would decrease. As recipients of the scriptures, when they are being preached, we want it to be so that what you hear, what you see is the operation of God. And it requires prayer to be able to do that because we are a, a, a people that we grew up with everything coming at it, delivered by men and their skills and abilities. But what God is requiring of us is that we pray that the biblically oriented sermon, the text and the context have full reign, full authority and free course. And the only way that it can be that is if it is the word of God with all of its power and all of its authority. Third, we look and we ask that God would have the word of God to move swiftly. The idea of swiftness there is what you see in the, in the first uh, definition it is given to, to speed on or to make progress. It was used in two different ways during that time. Paul probably used it in the sense of athletics, the runners, during the, the, uh, the races that would take place with the Greeks and the Romans. And so the image is of a strong runner and all the hindrances that might impede his progress and his speed are removed. But at the same time, he's pressing toward a goal, and he's moving with all diligence and power and might. And so there's this, this image of a, a runner strenuously moving forward. 
The Greeks in their odysseys and their stories would speak of, of the, uh, the free course or to speed on in terms of men that were in times of peril and shipwreck. And so all energy and all effort and all strength were invested in the saving and the rescuing of the ship and the men on board, even the saving of their own lives. And so the picture is that the word of God would have free course. That is, that it would be able to move effective, that it would be powerful and strenuous and, and reach its objective unhindered. So where does that leave us? Well, we know that when God dispatches his word, it moves swiftly. For example, concerning the weather, ice, snow, wind, and rain, etc., he's in Psalm 147 and verse 15, he sends forth his commandment upon the earth. His word runs very swiftly. So we get the image that the word is a, uh, a metaphor as it has feet, and it's a command issued by God, and it is dispatched. And it tells the elements of the weather what to do. So it just helps add to that concept that when we talk about the word of the Lord and we want it to move, we're saying that it's advancing. It's finding place, changing hearts, changing the way we think, changing the way we live. It's identifying the sin of every individual, the unbeliever and his own belief, and, be, and bringing about conversions and, and people to Jesus Christ. It is a work of the Holy Spirit in that it is not just the word itself, but God, Holy Spirit is the one that prepares, draws men, calls them in, and gives them the ability to receive and understand. Our duty would include that of minimizing distractions. And that begins with our, with our own preparation. The, 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 any anything that might draw our attention away from this authoritative language of the scripture. And we would ask that it would move swiftly to make, bring about progress in our own hearts. Where are we lacking? What is needed? Am I owning up to the, the call of the, of, the, of the scriptures, the commands that are there? When you read what Paul says, and we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you uh, withdraw yourself. He gives a command. And uh, just prior to that, he talks about the confidence that he has in verse 4. In the Lord touching you that you will both do and will do the things that we command. The scriptures anticipate a response. And the response is that of obedience. And our response to that statement of the word of God is that God make it possible that there can be this biblical progress happening within my own heart. And it would be a case as we sing in our meditation hymn at the beginning, change my heart, O God, make me more like you. You've already been practicing some of this just prior to the preaching of the scripture. Number four, we would pray that Jesus is glorified by our salvation. We're asking that when God uses the scriptures, that it brings about the, the, uh, the evidence of salvation we find in our, in our text in this that uh, as he makes that statement, having free course and be glorified. Another way of saying that is to say that we want to be able to observe and know that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one that becomes as the author of faith that people uh, are saved because of the scriptures directing their hearts to the merits of Jesus Christ. And so when an individual comes forward, when one confesses Christ as their savior, it's not because of what everybody else was doing or a, a simple misunderstanding, but rather Jesus is the author of, he brought in salvation to that individual's life. And because Paul's prayer request is gospel oriented, that is the, the first prayer request that everybody would have in their own heart. Lord, introduce me to your son, Jesus Christ. Allow him be that salvation is of the Lord. And allow him to be the finisher of my faith. Allow Jesus to be the one where I end faithfully serving him and honoring him and worshiping him. When you look at the scriptures, Acts chapter 13 
and we read this. In the next Sabbath day, beginning of verse 44, they, they, the next Sabbath day came almost, almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those things that were preached by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It is necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing that you put it from you, judge yourselves on worthy of the everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So that when the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation on to the ends of the earth. The gospel was to be mainly presented by Israel. They rejected the gospel. They rejected God, Jesus Christ. And so the same message now is going to be preached to the Gentiles. And that's what he says next. And have set the light to the Gentiles that you would be salvation unto the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, mainly that now salvation was for them, they were glad. They glorified the Lord. And as I read before, and as many as were ordained to eternal life. And so this is the effect of that what God looks for. He looks for this glorifying, this magnifying, this exaltation of Jesus Christ. The times in which we live are no different than the times in which Paul lived. When Paul went to Corinth, he knew what he was up against. He knew he was up against the philosophers, the, the great speakers. He knew that every time a man would stand up to speak, that he was in a contest. And there was a point system that was used by the, the listeners as to whether or not they enjoyed this man's presentation of his philosophy and his, of his speech, his theme or his subject. So when Paul enters into the city of Corinth, and he has the opportunity to, to speak, he's very careful that he does not follow the trendiness of the times and try and win the favor of the audience. But rather, we find that Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, in my speech, in my preaching, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. That is option number one. The enticing words of man's wisdom. Why do I say that? Because we enjoy enticing words of man's wisdom. We hear it every day. We watch it on the television. We hear it in the news. We read it in the paper. We want something that captures our interest. And the best way that that can be accomplished is when, when uh, sentences and paragraph are carefully crafted in such a way that it, we, it uh, calls for us to listen and to pay attention. And Paul says, that's not how I presented myself. It's not that he became sloppy in his language, but he was not going to use enticing words, nor was he going to use his human wisdom, but rather in demonstration of the spirit and power. The prayer that Christ be glorified is to pray that the Holy Spirit of power of God would have free course to be able to move carefully and precisely in my heart. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It will always be a contest. Every time the scriptures are being preached, there's going to be this contest in the heart of the listener. Am I looking for wisdom or am I looking for the power of God? Is my faith going to stand in the, the uh, sermon itself and its arrangement, or will the faith stand on the power of God? Paul was very careful to make sure that he would not give anybody a false bill of goods, a false invitation, but rather that the, Jesus would be glorified, that the word of the Lord would make progress swiftly, capturing hearts, and as it did in Acts, and they would glorify as new converts would glorify because it is God's word, Jesus Christ, and it is his power that changed my life. That's what we look for. We have to anticipate and ask that God would have that kind of liberty in our hearts. So you look at the last expression that is there, and be glorified even as it is with you. 
That's a pretty demanding statement. In one sense, he's saying uh, the, the contingent upon uh, the, the evidence of your life is going to have an effect on the predicted outcome of my message. So he's saying, I see biblical evidence of conversion. I've observed how you glorified God, you glorified the word of the Lord, and the message goes out from Thessalonica. And even as it was that powerful in your life, I want it to be the same way in everybody else that hears this word of the Lord. It means this to us, that there be the evidence of salvation. That if another individual, someone that is outside of Jesus Christ, is hearing your presentation and you're giving testimony of the power of God's word, would be, there be substantial evidence to back it up? If you're going to maintain that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, all things are passed away, and behold, all things are in the progress process of becoming new. That would be the evidence of salvation. And if you're going to speak that message, your listener, the people around you, would certainly want to be able to say, I understand, I can see what you're talking about because they'd be able to observe it in your own life. And we always have to be careful that our, our conduct, our language uh, maintains a, a, a status of godliness because others will watch. How many times have you ever said, listen, you can become a Christian. You want to trust Jesus Christ. He will change your life. Well, I know some people that trust Jesus Christ and their life's not any different than what it was when they, before they even went to that church service. How are you going to explain that? I really can't. Other than the fact that perhaps the word of God did not really take root. But why should we even have to get into that kind of discussion if every believer was faithful in, in being determined to bring forth the, the evidence of conversion in our own life? So how can the word of the Lord be glorified? i just give you three points. When Christ is magnified in me becomes my chief goal. When Christ magnified Christ exalted in your life becomes your primary concern. Now listen, I understand we have a lot of immediate concerns. And if we don't address immediate concerns, the, the world is going to fall apart. The church will fall apart. Things will not get done. But in the process of addressing the immediate there must be the most pressing. There must be the thing that is the priority. And everything that we do in the immediate sense is in the context of the most important sense, and that is that Christ is honored, that he is glorified, that the church is lifted up, that we, we bring forth a message that Jesus is within us and working. And so to magnify something is to take, when it comes to magnifying Christ in my life, it is to put a telescope on something that is big and it becomes larger through the lens of the telescope. Because Christ already is big, but when you look at him and you magnify him, you become the lens of a telescope that takes something the size of the moon or the sun and you enlarge it so that it is quite visible and the details of it become visible to the naked eye. That is what is meant by Christ magnified, Christ exalted. That becomes my chief goal. How can the word of the Lord be glorified in our own lives? When we make Christ the priority of exaltation. When the character of Christ is magnified by my life, by my thinking, by my decisions, by my actions, by maturity, by growing in grace, rooted and grounded in him, this mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus, the humble heart, the servant's heart, the God-honoring heart. And so the character of Christ becomes quite evident. And in that evidence is a magnification of Jesus himself. When the old habits are sin are replaced with new habits and are consistent with salvation. That's a very important phrase. We want a life that is fitting and is consistent with the terms of salvation. That is regeneration, a new birth, a new beginning, a new life 
a new goal, a new God, new Savior. And the consistency of habits fits with the pattern of the expectation of the scripture of what it means to be saved. We could say it this way, to be glorified even as in you, or the word of the Lord is glorified in you, or the gospel is glorified in you. That's what Paul is saying. And so his prayer and our prayer is that as, as we preach and you're listening, and as the preparation is taking place, you're, you're asking God just to continually work a biblically oriented sermon, a sermon that the scriptures will be able to run swiftly, unhindered, and, and uh, enter in to the mind, the will, and the emotions. That Christ is exalted. If not through conversion, it's going to be the maturity, the growing up, acting, uh, and behaving like Jesus Christ. And on this, then, on a, on a daily basis. So what are we going to take home from something like this? I'd like to just center it on the local church. The local church stands or falls upon the sermon. That's very important. That is, that's what rests upon my heart. That um, I, do not, I, I don't use sermonsforyou.com or here's today's message. They're out there. Personally, I go before the throne of grace and I ask God, you know, what, what is it? You know all of your people of South Dade Baptist Church. What message do you want them to hear? Or maybe it could just be for one person. God is sovereign. And so I, I trust and I depend that because the sermon decides the direction of the church. The sermon decides the maturity of the believers. The sermon decides whether a lost person will leave understanding the way of salvation and receiving it or rejecting it. The sermon decides whether the church continues to exist. You remove the value and the priority and the precedence of preaching from a church we can be South Dade Baptist Social Club. We can have our more than gatherings on a Sunday morning and let's throw breakfast and dinner in there while we are at it. And let's throw in a devotional so we have something that is like the historical evidence of what the church used to be. And have a whole wall full of preachers. And have a whole table full of food. And a whole bunch of little handouts and flyers with motivational messages. So that's the importance of a sermon, that it must be the church stands or falls on the sermon. The local church, people rise or fall upon the sermon. People, prayer before and during a sermon is to call upon God and to cause, Lord, cause your word to be effectual. It's like asking God, speak to me, cause it to be swift, cause Jesus Christ to be exalted, cause me to demonstrate and magnify Jesus, that the, this word of God is that which I praise him because he's made me more like your son. That's what you wanted all along. And we leave the, with, to develop the habit and commitment to pray for the preparation and the preaching of the word of the Lord. Gifts are great. I, I, you know, I I've, I've continue to thank you, and, and I, your generosity is just overwhelming. I'll have another bike. You know, we'll, we'll talk about this later. Just kidding. But I want you to know that those things are deeply appreciated. In my mind, that falls into part two of the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. You all do a wonderful job in meeting the material needs of, my, of your pastor and his wife. But my real concern is this, that the, the preparation of prayer for the interest of God's kingdom and his work would prevail. 
So that means throughout the course of the week, when you're, you, you want to develop a habit, and I'm asking you to do this, that Father, Lord, through the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit, that you would give our pastor the message for your people. Give my pastor the sermon and the text that speaks to my heart on this Sunday. Father, the entire ministry stands upon the delivery of the sermon and its content and its message and, and its focal point. We want to see South Bay Baptist Church continue to grow and to flourish and to be faithful and to be doctrinally true. But it requires the activity of prayer. Paul knew what would happen as he would preach in these cities. He knew the sovereignty of God and the power of the word of God, uh, that it doesn't even, it, it, there, nothing extra had to come on. But he, Paul also knew that it was necessary to pray. And prayer was the means by which God gives to us to be able to invoke his presence in his power to serve his purposes in the context of preaching. So Father, we pray that as we as we do this, this, this activity of preaching and listening, gifts that come from you and uh, the scriptures kept, preserved, and then uh, commentaries and the Holy Spirit to help us to rightly divide it. Father, we pray and thank you for its relevance that it remains consistent. Cultures change, our ideas change. But yet the word is there that you've given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. We praise you for that, Father. Our prayer is that we would be prayer warriors for the swift presentation and the power of your word. That we and others would glorify your word and exalt Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our Hymn of Invitation is number 366. I surrender all. If you will stand together as we sing this, 366. Let's sing the first and the last stanza of this hymn this evening, this morning. And really, what are we surrendering? Well, if you're not a believer, you want to surrender the, to the salvation that Jesus Christ offers as believers. We want to surrender our hearts and our minds to prayer during preaching. It's just that simple. Father, allow us to have that kind of give to you spirit within our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You